Aloha and welcome to The Creative Life, a collaborative production between Big Tech Hawaii and the American Creativity Association. I'm Darlene Boyd, your host today. Our guest, Hector Ramos, joins us from Cary, North Carolina. Dr. Ramos has professional international experience in the area of applied creativity and innovation. He often focuses on the coaching of executive individuals and groups in many international companies, including, but not limited to, Singapore, Indonesia, Dubai, Mexico, and the United States. Hector, I have heard more than once that a great coach is the secret to winning and staying on top. And I've also heard that professional coaches can build enthusiasm and passion where no one else can. It seems to me that there must be some truth in these commentaries, given the investments that companies are willing to make in coaching of high level executives and managers. So am I correct? And also if I am, just exactly what is executive or managerial coaching and what are the benefits associated with executive coaching? Well, you brought up a lot of quest questions there and points that are extremely uh, uh, useful to understand coaching. Um, I think it can be understood as uh, helping people solve problems more effectively through a series of questions. But the interesting thing is that you mentioned that coaches bring up more enthusiasm and a passion to people to achieve things. So in other words, it has a, an emotional impact on the person you are coaching. And uh, so I don't think that very often you see frameworks, including those emotional components. Now, one of the things I can tell you is that uh, people have uh, a lot of potential and in their jobs, they don't always use all the potential or the abilities they have, especially mm -hmm. thinking abilities. So a coach does this type of work that it's uh, tapping into the, the abilities not used. And uh, so that people can... Um, surprise themselves with the performance. I did not know I could do so much or I could do it so well. So a coach is supposed to do that, to facilitate a better performance. I like that, Hector. Uh, I, I know there's somewhat of a myth involved, or I should say when the gossip machine gets going in an institution or perhaps in a corporation, and somehow it leaks out that someone has a coach immediately the gossip starts to go, well, there must be, I knew there was something that he couldn't do or she couldn't do. I knew that they, they needed some help. And then the next question that usually, or the commentary is generally is, aren't they, what, what, how much money are they spending to give this person a coach? So tell me how it's determined as to which individual, the real honest to goodness truth as to how is it determined how uh, you identify which individual may need a coach? Well, I would suggest from the from my perspective, everybody needs a coach. So the, the whole thing here is that uh, coaches are un interpreted or understood in different ways in the market. Someone, as you said, will say, well, this person has a coach. Very likely there's something they cannot do. Well, what if they can do everything, but the coach is there to help them do it better? So that's a different perspective. That's what you call high peak or peak performance coaches. They are not coaches that are helping you to solve uh, areas of lack in your performance, but maybe to develop your potential and what you can do so much better than you could think of. So th uh, that is the key key thing. So how much do uh, companies spend uh, employing coaches? It really depends on the, the type of, um, this is, it can vary from $50 to $250, $300 an hour. Uh, it depends on the company they engage and the amount of sessions, the amount of people, it's always the package that they can negotiate. Um, but what I know is that uh, um, there's, a, there's a great degree of fluctuation in prices out there. But usually the good thing about coaching is that you can uh, test the um, defects very quickly. So you don't have to go one year doing coaching if in two months or one month it, you don't see that it's giving you some sort of hope and, and some sort of results in terms of what you can get. How, how available does a coach make himself or herself to a client? Well, this depends on the type of work that the coach is doing and uh, the, um, the amount of uh, efforts that the coachee can put into uh, that relationship and getting things done. Because coaching is also is always about uh, get, uh, implementation. 
It's not about just talking about things that could be and never doing anything. It's about uh, getting some results. So um, some coaches would coach once a week. I do, my experience has been once a month or once every two months. But again, because it's highly focused, I get a lot of uh, results in very little time. Would it be safe to assume that if you are the the coach and you're scheduled for a once a month kind of thing, if some kind of crisis would come up in that interim, you would make yourself available. Am I correct in thinking that? Yes. Uh, again, that can be part of the uh, contract that you have with the coach. Or the coach. So the, you say, well, uh, we need you to to give this one hour coaching every month. But if if you if we find that we need you. Can you become available in, in two days? I'm giving you like two day, two two day notice or something like that, and that, that can be part of the contract. So this is the creative life, and we're here to address things creatively. And uh, so, tell us how how can creative thinking help coaches deliver greater value? So there are a lot of frameworks for coaching. I can give you one very basic one, which is Good. step one: goal. Step two: What is your reality? Step three, what are your obstacles? And then step four, what, are, what is the way forward? So um, through questions, you can help people understand or clarify the, the goals that they want to get to achieve, to understand the information that is most important for in the terms of the reality, to identify or uncover what are the most important obstacles, and to, uh, to select what is the most effective way of moving forward. So as you can see, this way of, of defining coaching has a lot, it overlaps a lot with creative problem solving in terms of uh, defining a problem or, or identifying obstacles or coming up with uh, creative and unique solutions. So um, there is so much more than uh, creative thinking can give to coaching because it has the tools to do this type of, of, of work. Now, I'm not saying that coaching doesn't do the work. I'm just saying that you can use just to give you an example, sure. I went to a school in Singapore, uh, high school, and I, uh, and I helped them clarify. I was doing coaching with two people. I helped them clarify a problem, and it took me one hour and 45 minutes until they found out what was the key issues they were looking for. Now, I, because this was, it was not a, a something was paid, it was a favor I was doing some, some people, I decided to just yes, to stretch it and see how far, and I was going to stay there until they got some breakthrough. Um, but what I'm saying is that I use creative thinking to help them look beyond. And the moment they found out what is the, what is the key issue that they were looking, trying to solve, um, then they were so motivated to move forward. So what we say in creative thinking sometimes that uh, that clarity gives you the motivation to come up with the ideas to 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 get it solved. Yeah, I, I, it would seem to me that clarity is is quite essential and. Uh, those viewers that follow us on a regular basis have heard us say before that um, there is great difficulty sometimes in identifying what the real problem is. Often we think we know what the problem is, and you just mentioned the amount of time that you dedicated to get your folks to really focus on what the real problem was. Sometimes it's implicit and sometimes it's explicit, is it not? Yes. So what happens often is that we get uh, fixated by a way of understanding the problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we need to, uh, some, to get some help from outside to say, okay, well, have you considered this? Have you thought about this? Have you uh, thought about the connection between this factor or this, could this be a root cause a problem uh, or factor as well in this problem? And then uh, giving some evidence of why this could be that way. Um, now, as you can see, that already is getting a little bit into content, which is something that coaches, they don't hate to do. <laughs> so, so that's why creative thinking sometimes is probing, is uh, uh, suggesting certain things that when people start questioning themselves, the way they view reality, then they can uh, become more flexible in the thinking and say, okay, now I understand why uh, this has come to, uh, this has become a problem. You use the word uh, about your client or coachee being flexible, which leads me to another question. How ready does the client need to be to receive coaching? I mean, how long, give me some, some of your experience on how long it's taken you 
to get a client to where you feel that they really truly are, are welcoming you and listening to you. So what happens is that uh, in coaching, you always talk about creating some sort of rapport or relationship with your clients. So there has to be some sort of trust there. Um, one of the big, th big things in coaching is that uh, sometimes you deal with confidential or sensitive information that could be sensitive to, sensitive to company or maybe emotionally charged. So what happens is that you have to be 100% non-judgmental and non-biased. <laughs> and for, to do that, you have to be extremely clever or have a very strong relationship where you can come with to, to places of, okay, let's take a break, let's move, move come back, let's see what happened and, and reflect on, on the progress that is being made. So what I can tell you is that uh, most people, are, are it, they're, well, they're never ready to be coached because they have never experienced it. The same way <laughs> they're never ready to uh, swim if they have never uh, touched a swimming pool. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you can help them by creating this relationship, by getting to know, clarifying the purpose, the methodology, and also by uh, trying a small problems first, not the big problems, the small ones. So then you make it easy to go through the process instead of uh, and, and uh, helping people getting some, what I, I call uh, even small achievements and a small uh, victories that can motivate them to move forward into more difficult uh, problems. Is executive coaching the same as leadership coaching? Well, I think there's going to be an overlap as well. Executive coaching is very much about the uh, um, performance of executives so they can get everything that they need to get done well. No, but uh, executives are very often they are leaders. So there's going to be uh, some sort of, if you do coaching well, there's going to be a very much of an understanding of what leadership means and an empowerment of people because leader, leaders are as good as the followers who uh, get work done. <laughs> so to empower people and maybe in that way, coaching can help executives develop the leadership skills. So there, there's something I've experienced related to coaching, and I suspect if I have, then a number of our viewers probably have also, and that's the 360. I assume you're, do you use the 360? Well, I've used it before, but uh, yeah, I know tell what it is. About it. Tell us about it. Okay, so uh, I suppose that 360 is also going to be used uh, in different ways, depending on what type of instrument you use. What uh, uh, we try to do is uh, to get feedback from people around the client. So you could have, uh, so, so imagine that I'm coaching an executive and he's leading a group of five people. And then, uh, and these five people have some other people around them. So I'm going to get feedback about this person in terms of performance, relationship, et cetera, from these people, but also from the clientele, from the clients or from other people that engage with the executive, with my clients, in different ways. So that what happens is that I get a more um, comprehensive uh, data or information about my client's performance, and I could make some sort of con uh, conclusion about some of the key things that, that my, my client needs to address. When I said I've had experience, I've been on the side where uh, the coach would call myself, call me, as one of several people that you just described that work with a person. And then of course the concern being confidentiality and, and just how open and how comfortable I felt with the person that would be the coach in the process of interviewing and the way they established their questions. So um, my experiences have been very positive, not, not being the one that was being coached, but being the one that was being one of many interviewed to, to see perhaps so I assume that's to help the coach identify the strengths and weaknesses of the person they'll be coaching? Yes, yeah, because uh, perception is reality for some people. So mm -hmm. you, can, you may think that you have very good at communication and, 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 your, and your, uh, the people you work with, they disagree with you, <laughs> all right? So uh, to have this type of information can help you, but again, you have to, this type of interviewing, you have to be very careful to get to data and not and to leave opinions and feelings aside. Okay. And how much, how much time do you spend getting, getting to know your 
coachee, I'm going to call them your coachee, the person you're going to be coaching, how much time do you spend getting to know them before you really formulate a plan? And at how much does creativity play at that introductory portion? Well, so there's a questionnaire that the, the client has to fill in so I can get some information, some data that they can use to ask more questions and then figure out what's happening. Uh, so I found out that when I use the questionnaire and one extra hour, I can get uh, uh, quite a lot of information to start working with the clients. Um, but again, this is going to depend on the, the depth or the, the type of problem and complexity of the problem, because the moment you, ha you have something that it, it, uh, is super complex and you have a lot of people involved, then you will need much more time to prepare. Do you have, uh, do you have a schemata in your mind of the types of activities or the topics that you would address with with your the person you're going to coach. Um, I'm going to assume you mentioned communication being one. I think yeah. that would be rather generic, correct? Or yes. for almost any person you're going, you'll address communication. Yeah. So what happens very often is that, uh, uh, um, and and here's where creative thinking uh, plays a part. So um, the role of a consultant is to help people solve problems by giving them a solution themselves. So the consultant will bring expertise. So a consultant is not a coach. The, the pure 100% coach is the person that will only ask questions and get the, the, the coachee to solve the problems themselves. And in between, you have someone who can add a bit more clarification by probing, uh, employs a bit more of the creative thinking approach. And that's what I do. That's where I find that it can give a lot of value. So. Uh, but I, the whole thing here is clarifying and identifying the goal. What do you really want to achieve? And then what is the information that you need to know about this in order to get it solved? And I, f I find that very often people, they don't have enough information or the information is not good enough. So uh, that's going to be essential. For, um, and what happens is that in creative thinking, sometimes we have thought that just if you identify the problem, you can have it solved. Well you need to get some info, some data around it as well. So in order to get that data, what tools do you use to get this information? Well, creative thinking, it offers, yeah, it, yeah. I use a couple of templates that, that uh, are available everywhere. I mean, if you just uh, do a bit of research on creative problem solving, and, and they're also available online, so it's not uh, difficult to know the, uh, the type of questions about the when, how, who. Who is, who is involved in this and how are they involved? So you, you, you create your own questions around the template. And then you see, when, once you're asking the question, you see where is the, uh, you're getting more useful data. And then you dig in deeper that way. Uh, if, you, if you're getting nowhere, uh, then you move so, uh, to a different sort of questions, asking some, some other information about, uh, maybe also about the past. When, how often have you, uh, when did it become a problem? Why was it a problem? And what have you tried to solve it? So a bit of history is also important as part of the information you want to address. Have you tried to solve this? And what results have you got? And the, again, that's part of the question that is uh, readily available online for problem uh, exploration. You make it sound so simple. And I, I, <laughs> I know it's not. I'm, I'm sure that, um, do you have a coach? Do, do coaches have a coach? Do coaches I have had a, I've, well, it's not that I have a coach all the time. I think my wife is my best coach, <laughs> but uh, uh, I have had a coach in the past, and so I got I got to understand, and but I've got to to some training as well. So um, I, I was being I, a little bit glib about that, saying to you, but uh, as you point out, your wife, it would it would seem to me that uh, we all have a coach in some manner, and it's probably a special person, that person that you just come home and say. You know, can't imagine the day I had today, and then and it goes into a therapy session um, with that yeah. person. Yes, uh, or, <laughs> or, or someone who is going to challenge you to move, to go beyond. Yes, yes, interesting, interesting. Uh, since, we, since we've moved into the emotional type spirit of, of coaching, it's, it seems that if, if someone has a coach, they have a need. Can they coachy the client ever be too needy and if so how do you could deal with a client that is too needy and i think you might guess what i mean by that that they just want to call you every minute and 
<laughs> they, they, they just want to pour their, their soul out to you. Yes, um, sometimes that's going to happen. And uh, so the important thing is to, to know how to differentiate between coaching and, and psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. so, so that's some places where um, I advise people not to go, um, but to recommend somebody else who can go there and get better results. Um, I, th I think that uh, the cre coaching relationship is, is very much uh, a close relationship because you need to have a, a lot of trust to consider not only information, but how you assess information and how, what are your feelings towards that information? Are you being too critical? Are you being too judgmental? What is your belief system? So when you get into all that, definitely there's going to be some sort of uh, a connection of, well, this coach is really help, helping me a lot. So can I uh, have access to this coaching more often? And I, what I suggest is uh, to uh, teach people how to identify certain things, um, some tools where they can coach themselves. So you don't need the coach. You, you, you have the skill to help yourself. And I think that that's much more valuable than having uh, someone uh, um, being uh, ad, in some sort of a, an addiction, ad, addictive to relationship to coaching. I don't know if I exp I'm explaining myself. Uh, very clearly, yes. Uh, you, you mentioned some areas perhaps that, that you as a coach would, would not want to enter to. Might you be able to give us an example of, of some of those sensitive areas perhaps should not be touched on by the coach? And if so, where would you direct the person to go? Well, imagine that uh, um, the, the coach has had some sort of traumatic experience that has uh, um, created uh, some sort of a filter or a way of connecting with people where uh, they tend to be either hypercritical about people or very negative. And they, through the coaching experience, they have um, identified maybe one or two things that uh, maybe have they have contributed to this. So I would not go deeper and say, and can you just uh, into the, the history of the, of the clients or the coachee and say, can you tell me a bit more about how this trauma took place? So because that is more of the psychotherapy uh, or the role of psychotherapist. Mm -hmm. Now, what's going to happen is that for minor things, the fact that the people get to verbalize and make some connections that could bring a little bit of healing in terms of, hey, now I know why I'm such an obnoxious person. I'm going to change this thing. <laughs> and so, 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 so sometimes people do change and become a bit more uh, open because the coaching relationship is a, is a place of openness where you listen to each other and, uh, and that can be exported. Maybe I can, can connect with other people that way. I'm going to become a better listener and listen to emotions, not only to thoughts. Well, I mentioned that uh, that we we do have a few questions that have I mentioned to you that there were a few questions that came in be, before we uh, s began the show, and um, they're they're really pretty pretty simple ones too so far. Um, how much do coaches make, or how much may a coach make <laughs> in terms of uh, money? <laughs> if you create a very good brand and and you can connect with people that have. Uh, appreciate your your services. Everything it can go up to four hundred, five hundred dollars an hour. So there are coaches that get paid a huge amount of money. Now I know many of them they could get paid from one hundred to two hundred, and uh, and some people are starting they could start with fifty dollars or something. So it really depends on on the company that you engage and the type of contract that you have. Are you are you going to engage them for a whole year? It's going to be fifty sessions. Or it's going to be one session for one for three months. So I think that that's going to have an impact as well of how people uh, calculate their rate. What if someone would like to pursue? This is a question that was brought into us. What if someone would like to pursue a coaching career? Do you have some suggestions as to the first steps? Well, you have to identify. Look, do a bit of research online, but also look into, for instance, if you're uh, in a university, look, are, are there any type of training I can, I, I can attend? Uh, we know that, I know that in my university, there's a professor that is teaching people how to coach and they go through a certification. They take two classes and they do that. So that's an additional value. So uh, you may want to look around. The, the whole thing here is that uh, uh, I wouldn't go when I start, when you start, I wouldn't go to something so ex very expensive. And the reason is that a lot of the coaching expertise is acquired through practice. 
Mm-hmm. Makes good sense to me. Uh, does it, the, and, and this is the last question that I have for you uh, that has come to us. Does executive coaching really work? I think. I yeah, I mean, the, the reason the reason it works is because it's like an industry is growing. So it's, it's a growing industry and a lot of people engage and getting great value out of this. But in in a, a structure, in, a, in an industry that is not so structured, you could have a lot of people doing um, half-cooked coaching. So not very good. And so it's not going to work every time. <laughs> but I think that it will give you different types of value. And that's something to explore maybe in the future. But coaching will always provide value but maybe not the value that you are looking for straight away. I see. But uh, let me just ask, if coach, if you feel as a coach that it's just not working, is it your call to pull out? Or have you felt that someone asked you to, to really hang in there with the situation? I mean, for, for me, I haven't had anyone who, who has wanted to stop. So they all loved it. But it was also part of a training program. I see. Uh, so, uh, but um, in, I, I understand how this could happen. And that's part of the contract. I would suggest make it clear that if you want to stop coaching anytime, you can do it. That you could, you could call it. Hector, thank you very much. We're coming up to uh, the end of the time that I have to spend with you. Uh, I've learned quite a bit. And for our viewers, you have been watching The Creative Life on Big Tech Hawaii with our guest creativity and innovation expert, Hector Ramos. We hope that your time spent with us offered you a new strategic perspective of applied creativity as we discussed unexplored areas of professional coaching practices. Join us in two weeks for the next edition of The Creative Life. Until then, aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.